Yeah, welcome. Hello, Philosophy Roulette Times, number 217, where I read and review philosophy papers live on Twitch and the internet. So I hope all you people on the internet are doing well and uh, everything is uh, good for you. Um, I had a long day, so oh, I figured I might as well just throw a little stream up. Haven't streamed in a few days, been slightly busy. Not too busy, but people be asking me for stuff, and I try to say yes now. It's, um, it seems a little wrong to be telling people no if I can help, even if it's, yo, Cirky, and what's up? Yeah, it seems wrong to say no to people nowadays for some reason. It's just like, you know, everyone is, uh, <laughs> out of patience, and so I feel like I should, uh, everyone get, deserves like a little bit extra uh, whatever, so been trying to say yes to people. Anywho, what's up? How are you doing, Cirque? And I figured I'd just read a random philosophy paper and try not to uh, lose my mind too much. I guess a little tired. I hope you're doing well. How are you? <sighs> Appreciate your help with the uh, getting the uh, copy up for the Minesweeper stuff. Thank you. So let's see what's new in here. Oh boy, Proof and Falsity, A Logical Investigation in Analysis by Lavinia Piccolo. I actually know Lavinia Piccolo. She, I saw her give her talk here in New York. Um, let's go see if this is available then. <laughs> You're doing great. That's good to hear. So let's see if uh, Lavinia is available. Uh, dag nab it. Not. I'm have to go maybe find this later and get back to it because actually I don't know Lavinia's kind of technical. No problem. It was long overdue. <laughs> hey, yeah, I, well, that's my fault. I appreciate for you your help on that. Oh, is this okay? No, no, no. This is a uh, review. Okay, of a book. All right. So, okay, nothing. I'm not missing out on this. It's just a, a review. Otherwise, we could go look at some of Lavinia's other work, which is good. Um, like I said, I've heard her give a talk before and. Uh, it was interesting stuff when she was here in New York visiting. So. Let's see what Mind has. Uh, let's see. Let's go see if there's anything forthcoming. I don't know if they have page numbers on their forthcoming, so I don't know if I can... No, maybe. We got... Okay, this is, it looks like a review because it's by Chakravarti. Chakravarti, excuse me. I apologize for how I say everyone's names, and that's the one of one, so yeah. So, cool. Let's see if anything's here. Categories, it's a review. Thinking, being, yeah, review, review, review. Okay, not going to read anything in mind then. Metaphysics of Material World. So, Philosophy of Science. The Impossibility of Confirmation by Coherence. Let's go just check out that too many review it a lot of reviews in continental philosophy review no papers the monist i haven't seen the monist up in a while they don't they only publish like once or twice a year or something let's go check them out is there anything forthcoming let's see what we got let's see if they no page numbers there cool so let's see. Oh yeah, I did get a request from uh, Cinesemiotics. I will get to that paper. Um, you guys are always free to request something. Um, I now have a channel reward. You can re use that, but I'll probably just read your paper. Cinesemiotics, yo, I got your request. I am not in like a good enough mental state to give like your paper a uh, straight up reading at the moment. So I'm gonna do something else and let someone else, other someone else's paper suffer. <laughs> So I appreciate you stopping by, but I have the paper I downloaded. It's saved on the computer. So when I'm in a uh, bit more, when I have a bit more mental power, I'll get back to that one so that I can uh, at least do it some justice. Was it you that sent me? Uh, it doesn't matter. If it was you, that's what it is. If it was somebody else, I also did it. But I can't even remember like simple things at this point. So let's see. We've got free will and quantum mechanics. That might be cool. We've got a conversation between Jacques Bouvers and Hillary Putnam. Was this a Hillary Putnam thing? Because Hillary Putnam, Hillary Putnam, Hillary Putnam. Maybe it was a Hillary Putnam uh, focused article uh, paper. Ah, uh, that's right though. Do I have access to this? These papers? It's on Academia. Maybe. If it's good, you can take credit. That's usually how it goes. And if not, it was definitely my fault. 
Ah, uh, it looked interesting because it was um on literature and uh, semantic paradoxes like the liar. So they were gonna go over five different. Uh, so this is interesting. I don't have, I haven't done anything in the monist now. This is not like pleasant because it's like small words and like all the way like full pages. But you know what? Let's give it a shot because I have not done anything on the monist before. So why not? Is this one it? Free will. Uh, yeah, free will and quantum mechanics. Cool. So this is uh, a monist paper. I have not had the opportunity to read anything in the monist. Hilary Putnam, for those who know or may not, is a uh, rather famous or well-known philosopher. Um, so. Let me just do the one last little thingy. Here we go. And if you want to grab the paper, of course... Link is in chat. And, uh, there we go. No, do not pause due to scroll. So that's cool. Okay. So, yeah, and if you ever come by, you can, uh, grab the paper by typing exclamation point paper in the chat or request one and maybe I'll read it. You know what? Let's go with the, uh, not grape juice. Cool. So, abstract. No, we're not reading the abstract. No guardian spirit will cast lots for you, but you shall choose your own destiny. The blame is his who chooses. What? We can blame whoever we want? Cool. In philosophical debates about free will, the last few decades have witnessed a rest... Yep. Uh, let's go with resurgence of libertarian incompatibilism, or libertarianism, the once discredited view that free will exists and is incompatible with the truth of determinism. Now, I always had a problem with this. I don't know why people assume the truth of determinism, and therefore I'm also not a libertarian. Bubba Bloop, what's up, what's up, Bubba Bloop, reading this paper here, it just started, it's on free will and quantum mechanics. You can't stay, that's cool, so thanks for stopping by. Yeah, I'm just going to do a probably not so easy philosophy stream, but I just can't think at the moment. So the first, best thing to do when you can't think is read philosophy. They do the thinking for you. So, yeah, I don't really know why anyone actually believes in determinism because I don't know why anyone thinks it's true. Um, I know why they think they think it's true. I just don't believe that usually either. So, who cares? So, whatever. So, but yeah, nowadays we've got a resurgence of libertarian incompatibilism. Basically says you got free will and the world is deterministic, but there's something very special about you. And that means you don't have to follow the rule, the laws of the universe. I deny the truth of determinism and I find that libertarian position not to my liking. I find that very silly. Um, in fact, so, um... <laughs> It like makes me giggle. Actually, it's that bad. I'm like I don't understand why people do this. I, I understand the attraction of it. I just it does not make any sense to me. But anyway, let's continue then. Quantum mechanical indeterminacies feature prominently among the reasons for which this resurgence has occurred. Yes, and people love saying, "Oh, it's quantum physics, and that's why we have free will." Yeah. If such indeterminacies are attributed to the real nature of the world rather than being interpreted epistemically or the, as in the so-called Copenhagen interpretation or within a deterministic theoretical context as in the Bo Bohmian mechanics, then we have a solid scientific reason to think that determinism is false. Excuse me. And if this may open conceptual space for the idea that free will is rooted in indeterministic processes, as claimed by libertarianism. So the idea is that, look, in quantum physics, you've got things that are not deterministically uh, set. So if there's something that's not deterministically set, then that could be where free will sort of enters the picture. Because if physics doesn't uh, govern everything in the universe, it has like sort of its domain, and then the quantum area says, look, the physics of this is not set, and this sort of puts a limit on what we can talk about deterministically, then people say, well, look, then that's where free will lives. It's in that area. It's like, 
here's the deterministic stuff. And if you get too small, it gets deterministic, it gets a probabilistic or indeterministic below there. And we can interact with that, and that's where our free will is. So that's kind of the idea. This view, however, traditionally faces two main objections. Quantum indeterminacies are irrelevant at the macroscopic level, in which free will, if it is real, is exercised. And two, if on the contrary these indeterminacies are relevant for free will, they are so for the wrong reason, since indeterminism, far from guaranteeing freedom, only allows meaningless chance to determine our actions. Yeah, so this is basically saying, well, look, you don't have free will, you have probabilities then, and that's not what you want in free will. In free will, you want your decision to matter, not for it to just be some chance of what the probability is. And the second part is, if it's too small where this exists, like, you still need it out at, like, the brain level, like, at sort of, like, in cells, what the cell is doing and talking, the neurons talking. And if the indeterminacy is at, like, the parts that make up the cells, that's too small for us to actually have anything that we interact with in our brains or whatever people want it to be. Okay, in this paper we discuss a prima facie promising reply to the second objection, one that Putnam had in mind when he argued that, contrary to the first objection, quantum mechanics is not irrelevant to the problem of free will. In 2014, however, a following discussion with other the other author of this paper, Putnam conceded that the view he defended in that lecture and on subsequent occasions was mistaken. Here we discuss the source of that mistake because we believe this may be helpful in assessing the prospects for libertarianism. Okay, so we're going to talk about well, what they said, quantum mechanics and free will, and um, basically the failure of one of these famous uh, defenses that Putnam put out um, in 1979. And this is why I was saying that he's a well-known person, for those who don't know. He's got these really interesting arguments, and basically back in this sort of time period, um, uh, they've been massively influ influential, and he's got like great thought experiments and people like that stuff makes a I, I like thought experiments it, they really a lot of times give people a concrete sort of thought you don't have like they're not of pictures in philosophy and like having a good, nice thought um really can you know do well for uh, a theory okay the return of libertarian incompatibilism in his seminal an essay on free will Peter van Inwagen wrote that compatibilism about freedom and determinism was the received opinion and that its negation incompatibilism could hardly be said to be a popular thesis among present-day philosophers. That's 1983. A few la years later, however, van Inwagen, so this is 14 years later, in philosophy times that's a blink of an eye, so it is only a few years, wrote that compatibilism is nowadays widely regarded as implausible. So, yeah, in the early 80s, compatibilism and then now it's like implausible or in in the late 90s so uh, web 1.0 days even if the latter claim was clearly exaggerated oh yeah and please people if you're there and you have questions let me know i'm just like reading this for you know giggles but yeah I try to give good feedback and let me know if anything's unclear even if the latter claim was clearly exaggerated, as it was just implausible, that was a meta-thought experiment wall inducted. Now, <laughs> that is the entire thing of, like, uh, this whole, like, series of uh, philosophy roulette. It's all, like, sort of a meta-philosophy game. I'm actually, if you think about it, this is actually a meta-journal review. I am reviewing previously published things, which normally doesn't happen on articles like you have like reviews of books but i'm actually doing a meta journal of like uh published papers so this is all a meta thought experiment on philosophy actually meta philosophy if you will i'm not entirely sure what my relationship to meta philosophy is i should actually look that up Ugh, things to do i also have to do like the philosophy of twitch papers and streaming I'm getting busy okay even the latter claim was exaggerated, it's certainly true that in the last few decades there has been a change in tone in the discussion of free will, mostly because incompatibilism now has many more advocates than in the past. Indeed, all main varieties of incompatibilism have gained more credit in the philosophical community. Hard determinism, or according to which there is no free will because determinism is true, impossibilism or illusionism, according to which free will is impossible, since besides being incompatible with determinism, is also Incompatible with determinism, it is also incompatible with indeterminism. 
and libertarianism, according to which free will exists and is rooted in indeterminism. And like I said, let me make myself clear, um, I don't like the, the notion of determinism and indeterminism, and so I don't actually fall into libertarianism, even though I also deny uh, hard determinism. <coughs> so, I think this is the wrong uh, distinction to make. At least three reasons may be given for the resurgence of incompatibilism. First, compatibilism, the traditional majority view in Anglophone philosophy, has faced strong criticism, much of which can be based on the so-called consequence argu argument. Uh, second, a number of sophisticated versions of the main varieties of incompatibilism have been developed. Third, more scholars today than in the past claim that quantum mechanical indeterminacies play a relevant role in the macro-level processes that generate our decisions and actions. And this, as mentioned, has given multiple, has given impulse to a resurgence of libertarianism. In the rest of this article, we will discuss the last issue, and in doing so, we'll assess the prospects of a libertarianism based on quantum mechanical indeterminacies. Yeah, see, yeah, I don't like this. The, the idea that there's quantum mechanical indeterminacies I don't like, and so I, dis, I dislike the entire notion of determinism here, or indeterminism. Okay, but my complaints aside, let's see what these folks say. Determinism implies that all the actions we perform, the choices we make, and the thoughts we have are necessitated by the total state of the world long before we were born. However, some of some of the philosophers who believe in free will, the advocates of libertarianism, believe that determinism is false. The best known version of libertarianism is the so-called agent causation view. According to this view, free will does not consist only in the action being caused by the agent's unconstrained desires and beliefs, which would just be a normal case of event causation. Rather, the self itself, the self in quotes, itself can cause change in the world without being determined in doing so, and this particular peculiar form of causation is irreducible to event causation. Yeah, because look, uh, event causation is not just caused by the unconstrained desires and beliefs. I mean, that just like if you're saying they're unconstrained, it just happens. But this is in some sense the whole self has ability to do something, not because they're unconstrained, but it actually has uh, like efficacy. And it doesn't just go down to like some sort of event happening, the event maybe not being so constrained. Traditionally, however, agent causation has provoked serious objections, for example, that it is metaphysically obscure, at odds with naturalism, and merely ad hoc. In the last decade, several versions of this view have been offered aiming to respond to those objections. One of the best examples in the sense is the conception of agent causation developed by Timothy O'Connor, who has summarized it in this way. Having the properties that subserve an agent causal capacity doesn't produce an effect. Rather, it enables the agent to determine an effect within a circumscribed range. Whether, when, and how such a capacity will be ex exercised is freely determined by the agent. So I guess like the will, which is the agent caused capacity, like the free will here, that sort of gives you a domain of like action, like a little bit of space that you can use to then exercise, to then determine an effect. So that's what the free will is. It gives you sort of like carves out, it circumscribes a range. And within that sort of like range, then you have free will and like sort of the rest of the world does not, uh, the like the physical world cannot like sort of enter that little safe zone. If suggestive, this claim sounds rather mysterious and indeed may suggest that, however ingenious, ingenious O'Connor's theory may be, it explains obscurium per obscurius. This is um one of my this is actually my David Sonian agency. I completely forget what D David so uh, David says, but uh, Davidson says, but maybe. I actually this is my one of my favorite uh this is not the Latin I use for it, but this is obscure like the obscure from the other from the more obscure and so basically it's just saying look you're trying to explain something we don't understand with something also we don't understand and that's therefore not an uh not an explanation explaining something we don't understand with something we also don't understand doesn't count uh, it's a not a logical fallacy but it's an informal fallacy it's one of my favorite ones um, it's the other one is ignotum per gnosis. It's a uh, ignorance from ignorance. This is obscurity from obscurity. This is not the uh, what do we got? Pla uh, David? Yeah, I'm not reading the whole Plato thing on uh, Davidsonian. It, this could be Davidsonian. I'm just not sure. 
at the moment. This is not the place to discuss the issue in detail, but Agent Kozla's view faced difficult conceptual and empirical problems. Go read this link if anyone is interested. I'm sure <laughs> it's right. Some have claimed that free will is not a causal power at all. On this view, what is required for claiming that an agent has performed an action out of free will is only that an adequate intentional explanation can be offered for that action. There is no need, nor is it possible, to offer a causal explanation of that action. Aha! So, we got there. The view, however, does not adequ adequately respond to a classical argument that Donald Davidson offered against Wittgensteinian non-causal theories of action. In order to decide from among all the possible intentional explanations of an action which one is correct, we must assume that the correct explanation is the one that appeals to the reasons that actually cause the agent to perform that action. Moreover, and relatedly, the non-causal account faces difficulty in accounting for an essential requirement of free will, that is, the idea that an agent controls the action she performs. Intuitively, control appears to be an intrinsically causal notion, and if this intuition is correct, lack of causal power by the agent would reduce agency to a mere epiphenomenon. Okay, yeah, so basically, if you have yourself like a little area where you can act, but you can't actually explain how you act within that area, that's not what we mean by free will. What we mean by free will is that you get to choose, and just because you have free will circumscribes an area that acts, then you haven't actually explained free will because having an area to act in, like having a playpen, does not describe what you're doing in your playpen. Like, it, that's not what we mean. I'm not kidding that I own the domain. <laughs> I will not ask why, but that's uh, fun. I mean, yeah, I won't ask why. I'm sure there's reasons. In this light, both agent causalist and non-causalist theories of free will appear unsatisfactory to many. The challenge, as William James saw, is to arch articulate a libertarian view that acknowledges real agency, that is, it is causalist to that extent, but does not appeal to unintelligible forms of agent causation, that is, causation by an irredu irreducible self. So if you say the causation is um, like fundamental, then you can't say anything about it is the problem, and we don't really know what it is, and you're just sort of got an ad hoc, well, it just is that way, and so if you want to say anything, then you can't, re this is not a, you can't just say you have free will, you have to say something more, but that doesn't also work, okay, James developed a view of his own, of his own that he believed to be to fulfill these requirements, but unfortunately, he held an unacceptable view of natural laws as approximately correct human idealizations, however, nowadays, James is challenge could be expressed in this way. Is it possible to formulate a satisfying libertarian view of free will that is compatible with a realist interpretation of natural laws? The increased popularity of realism in recent philosophy of quantum mechanics may have provided breathing space for this neo-Jamesian libertarianism, or at least so it may seem. Okay, so some sort of pragmatic view of uh, the physics. An influential view of this kind has been pro proposed by Robert Kane. According to Kane, the free will we really care about, the kind that makes us the true originators of our actions, manifests itself in our conscious deliberations, which are caused by indeterministic processes that are neither contra-causal nor purely random. More precisely, according to Kane, a deliberation is under is underdetermined is the underdetermined result of the effort of the will, which we go through when we when we choose al oh, sorry hard sense when we choose among alternative courses of action. In doing so, we decide without being determined to do so between the competing reasons that support the different available choices. In this sense, Kane writes, the choices we eventually make, though undetermined, can still be rational, made for reasons, and voluntary, made in accordance with our will. <laughs> you forge to a book on consciousness? Well, at least you're putting it to good use, then. Therefore, indeterminism plus efforts of the will, instead of generating mere random randomness, makes freedom possible. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. So within this space of, like, area that we have like freedom the physics is indeterminate and then our deliberation is actually sort of like choosing in that indeterminacy which one it likes best so it's not determinate but somehow acts causally within the space of indeterminacy huh. 
This is the analysis that Kane develops on the conceptual side. As to the empirical side, Kane speculates that even if chaotic systems are deterministic, a combination of chaos and quantum physics might provide the genuine indeterminism one needs. Kane's idea is that there may be chaotic processes in the brain that magnify quantum indeterminacies in firing of individual neurons. However, a traditional objection faces Kane's view and similar ones, namely that indeterministic contexts appear only to produce randomness, which makes agent control impossible. And without control over her own choices and actions, no agent can be said to be free. This is certainly a major problem for neo-Jamesian libertarian views, but perhaps there is a possible way out of this difficulty as Putnam came to think some years ago. Yeah, so... How do the indeterminisms, which are probabilistic, then make you have choice, which um, something being like a coin flip does not mean you have a choice because then it's clearly up to the coin and not you. <coughs> cool. So, yeah, and like I said, please ask questions. This is, uh, I mean, this is kind of stuff I like. This, I was happy to read this paper. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but like, you know, we got some metaphysics over here, we got some science over there, we got, like, uh, a little bit of history thrown in, it's a nice paper to read, so it's like, yeah. Like, I bet we're gonna get a thought experiment right here, like, this is kind of, uh, <laughs> this stuff, well, I don't read this stuff now, but this is the sort of stuff I would have liked to have read uh, a few years back, I'm very happy to read this paper. Like, it's not, uh, like, I mean, I can just say, like, nowadays, we're talking about science stuff, but we haven't actually gone into any hard science, and we're, but we're still talking about complicated scientific ideas here. And so, like, we've got, like, a little bit of uh, history from, like, the 1800s, we got, like, the pragmatism, we got a, a, one of my favorite uh, fallacies going on over here, um... Just the structure of this paper is, uh, I think, kind of nice in terms of how to write a philosophy paper. You set it up. You got yourself uh, going up. You're, like, working into the theory here, but then you then you fall back to the sort of, like, history and how this got these ideas got developed. Give some examples. Give, like, sort of the, mod the more contemporary take of these uh, older ideas. And then... So, so it's all, all worked up here, and now you've got sort of like a feel for like the history, the theory, and like the current state of the world. So that's kind of nice. Okay, continuing, and please, like I say, ask questions. Freedom and Holistic Indeterminism. Putnam, 1979, page 154. Suggested that, contrary to common belief, quantum mechanical indeterminacy provides the freedom the libertarian wants. So this is the, I guess, the start? of appealing to quantum physics to say this is how we have uh, free will? I don't know. One way of scoffing at the in at the significance of indeterminism is to pretend that it makes no difference to ordinary macroscopic events such as the motions of human bodies. This is an outright mistake, and Anscombe disposes of it with great elegance. Another way is to say that we are no better off in terms of moral responsibility if our actions are the products of chance than if they are determined. Yeah, that's right. This claim changes the question, of course. We were not talking about moral responsibility, but about freedom, and although these are related, no freedom, mor no moral responsibility, at least in Kant's view, they are not the same. Excuse me. The original problem was an incompatibility between deterministic physics and freedom, and we have seen that this does not exist any longer. I know of no argument whatsoever that there is an incompatible incompatibility between indeterministic fi physics and freedom. But responsibility is important too. What reason is there to think that there is an incompatibility between indeterministic physics and responsibility? Okay, so we've moved from freedom to responsibility here, which is an interesting move. The obvious objection to what Putnam wrote here is that if we are, so to speak, no better than a roulette wheel, and there's philosophy roulette, <laughs> then we not only lack responsibility, but we lack any meaningful sort of freedom. In the lecture from which we have been quoting, he attempted to meet this obvious objection thus. The objection 
is that indeterministic physics says that our actions, or at least their component body bodily motions, are produced by chance, and how can we think of ourselves as a kind of roulette wheel and ascribe moral predicates? But it is just false that indeterminist indeterministic physics says that our actions are produced by chance that is by chance with a capital c so as uh yeah we're treating chance as the causal agent here and that's kind of what's you're kind of treating it chance as having agency and that is what is controlling us not ourselves but chance as an agent in the system Indeterministic physics uses the notion of probability, and there is no reason to interpret probability as Aristotelian chance, which was a cause, the cause of which, a cause of whatever is unexplainable. Yeah, so, this is the sort of thing. Yeah. So, this is like the agent in the system is Aristotelian chance, and that would be someone other than you making the decision that you did. If we stick to what is generally agreed among scientists, all we can say is that probability means the presence of statistical regularities. Now, no philosopher ever doubted that there are statistical regularities in human behavior. Okay, so this is a very clever move. I mean, I object to it now, but, I mean, it'd be very uh, hard to... Uh, this is, is uh, going to be hard to get around. Is probably why it took Putnam 30 years to... Uh, decide it was wrong or 20 years whatever it was we'll we'll see where they're going i mean i have things i would say about this but uh, let's continue the problem with that with this is that even if we interpret the role of indeterminism in the production of actions in probabilistic terms instead of thinking of it as a causation by chance neither james nor the agent causalist would be satisfied with the idea of a little man inside one's head who spins a roulette wheel every time one has to make a decision, either to determine what alternatives one would consider or to determine what the decision would be. It is indeed true, as Putnam 1979 claimed, that such a model were correct and were we to replace a roulette wheel with a truly indeterministic quantum process, say the emission or non-emission of a particle, would make it the case that the future is neither nomologically necessitated by what has happened in the past, nor caused by chance. And nomologically necessitated just means by the laws of nature. So it wouldn't be determined by the laws of nature, and nor would it be just a random chance. However, on such model, it remains the case that the future is nomologically necessitated in terms of statistical regularities. So this would nomologically necessitate, I guess, in a causal way, but not a statistical way, by something that is in no way under the control of the agent, and we do not believe that this would or should have satisfied James. So what the, li what the libertarian and what and whether or not she believes in agent causation needs is a kind of causation that is neither deterministic nor roulette wheelish, a kind of causation that allows for control by the agent. In other words, our decision must be neither determined by the past state of the world nor determined by chance events that are themselves not under our control. But how can there be a tertium quid? So yeah, so it's not determined by the history of like the physics of the world, and it's not just a random coin flip either that is somehow off on its own. You need a, a, a tertium quid, some sort of mental substance, I don't know, we'll find out. Although he did not publish on the topic of free will again, he did not make the, he did not make this point in the place of the facts in a world of values. He did not make this point. He didn't make it. He did. Well, he did not make this point in the place of facts and world values. Putnam thought and frequently told friends that this tertium quid exists. Okay, so he just is declaring it for whatever reason. Interesting. His idea was that in quantum mechanics, indeterminacy does not arise only from localized chance events. There is, he claimed until in conversation with other author of the article, a devastating objection arose that led us to write this joint paper, a kind of holistic indeterminacy in quantum mechanics that arises simply from the uncertainty, uncertainty principle, and this holistic indeterminacy is just the needed tertium quid. So he thought there was something else going on, interesting, and he had not actually explained it, and when he explained it, some guy blew it up. <laughs> That's terrible. You thought something for 30 years, you talked to some dude about it, and he'd be like, oh, what about this? And you're like, dag nabbit, 30 years? <laughs> I'm like, keck w Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. 
It happens. It happens a lot. I mean, the, the most uh, classic example on well, well, recent times is uh, Russell's letter to Frego, where he uh, mentions the Russell's paradox and how it basically destroyed Frega's whole logicist proge- product uh, project. And when I was uh, being taught that, the teacher, excellent, excellent philosopher, a uh, good teacher too, uh, excellent teacher also. Um, it was just like we don't know what happened to Frega that day. We we just don't know. But it blew up his entire world. It did. We do know the the, the date that the neck that the reply letter was sent. He must have wrote writ that wrote that paper like in the reply letter immediately back to Russell saying, "Oh my lordy, what have you done?" Basically. If only I could, like, see this problem correctly. Um, so we know it, it affected him, but, like, it completely destroyed, like, the complete philosophy, philosophical view. This is just one thing here. But uh, you might think something for many years, and someone just comes along like, nah, that's wrong. You're just like, oh, man. But it does happen. To explain this, we need, a rev- we need to review a point on which we still agree with what Putnam wrote in that essay. Namely, he criticized the idea that probability is the same as chance in the intuitive sense. He referred to this intuitive sense as chance with a capital C, that is, chance as it was conceived in Aristotle's metaphysics, as a sort of, sort of pseudo-explanation for the counter-nomological, the unpredictable. Yeah, so that w- something that explains something that goes against the laws of uh, the causal... Um, laws of nature. So, this notion survives in a in such expressions as produced by chance. But strictly speaking, in modern mathematized science, chance does not refer to something that produces events. Indeed, Putnam said, "No one, not even the most extreme libertarian, ever doubted that there are s- true statements of the form: ninety percent of the people with such and such temperament and upbringing tend to succumb to such and such a temptation." This statement does not say that the succumbing of each individual is produced by something called chance. It does not say anything about the individual event at all. Yeah. It says something about the history and what happens to the history. However, if we interpret quantum mechanics as saying something, as saying that the reason we cannot predict deterministically what percent of the population will succumb to the relevant temptation is simply that the choice is caused by, let us say, a quantum junk a quantum jump in which a certain atom jumps in a different energy level, then given the result of the jump, we are no more free than if the role if the whole physics had been deterministic and that the unpredictable part, the jump, was clearly not subject to our control. If that is right, the image of quantum mechanical indeterminacy, then if if that is the right image of quantum mechanical indeterminacy then if quantum mechanics is correct we are to all intents and purposes under the control of a large number of roulette wheels the atoms that jump or fall or fail to jump or whatever in short the threat is not that chance is a cause which is the threat pat putnam discussed in the essay but that our decisions might depend on local indeterministic events over which we clearly have no control that is the th- a threat to libertarianism no matter what our interpretation of probability is but as we said earlier putnam thought there was a holistic interpretation of quantum mechanical indeterminacy that avoids its consequence the tertium quid that we have referred to above again yeah so if you were really thinking about chance as an agent, that's that's kind of missing the point. It's that even if it's not an agent, it's just a set of roulette wheels. You don't want your life to be determined if you think you have free will, will by a set of roulette wheels either. That sounds like you have no will at all. Okay. The tertium quid idea was subjected subjected was suggested to Putnam by a by a problem set used in physics courses at MIT where he taught between 61 and 65 that problem set illustrates precisely how physical theory could be indeterministic without positing quantum jumps or little roulette wheels of any sort students were asked to assume just one principle from quantum mechanics but not to assume that matter consists of atoms or indeed that matter has any particular constitution at all the one principle was that the product of uncertainty in the position of any object and the uncertainty in its momentum or its velocity since we assume masses have definite magnitudes is always greater than a given 
constant. The Heisenberg's formulation change in delta P, delta X is greater than or equal to H bar over 2. Because that's the classic representation of a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The student was supposed to imagine that an elastic ball treated as a perfect solid was positioned a certain distance above a point of perfect pyramids. A, a, the point of a pyramid. So we've got a ball. Let's see. We've got... How am I going to do this? What do we got? Okay. I've got my owl here. This is an owl. You see my owl? So there's a perfect pyramid right here. The owl beak. And we've got a ball that's like right above here. So Putnam didn't remember whether it was supposed to be an uncertainty in this vertical distance or whether the uncertain Can't see my owl. Um in this vertical distance or whether the uncertainty principle applied only to horizontal velocities, probably the latter. So he was thinking it was coming this way, but we're going to do above. Okay, in classical physics, setting both uncertainty simultaneously equal to zero, the ball when released would drop down until it touched the point of the pyramid. Okay, so yeah, this would drop and then would hit the uh, beak. Okay, bounce straight up, fall down, and so on would bounce forever because it was a directly, it was a perfect ball directly above the perfect point of the pyramid. And so it would definitely just bounce up and down forever because it was perfectly symmetrical. But given the assumed uncertainties of both horizontal position and horizontal momentum, this will not happen. Students were asked to, one, find a formula for the expected value of the number of times the ball would bounce before missing the tip of the pyramid, after which it wouldn't continue to bounce as a function of delta P and delta X. Two, using the calculus of variations, find the values of delta P and delta X, the uncertainties in question for which that number is a maximum, and three, calculate that number. It turns out that given the Heisenberg formula, the number is something like 33. In other words, a world governed by just the uncertainty relation would exhibit indeterminacies whose explanation has nothing to do with quantum jumps or other locally indeterministic events. This seems to put in the very needed model of the kind of indeterminacy required for free will. Okay, so what's happening here is we've got a pointy thing that's going pointy and a ball that's going right on top of it. And because you don't actually know where it is at all times due to indeterminacy, the, when it bounces, one of the times is going to somehow be not exactly on center because the indeterminacies will somehow misalign because they're prob where it actually exists is probabilistic. It doesn't exist where you think it is. It's only a probability distribution. And therefore, the two things that are, even when you set it up, in theory to be directly above and below each other, they are not that eventually. Thank you, Owl. I appreciate your help. I think I was at Ikea when I was like a kid and they were like a quarter. I was like, this is the coolest thing you can actually buy for a quarter. Look at that. So yeah. <coughs> but is it quantum mechanical causation actually holistic? But is quantum mechanical causation actually holistic? Okay. Of course, much quantum mechanical causation is of the roulette wheel type. Localized chance events such as the absorption or non-absorption of a photon by a half-silvered mirror can determine the fate of an unfortunate cat, as in Schrodinger's famous thought experiment. But even if a physical system, a ball, has no internal physical structure at all, as long as its position and momentum obeyed the famous uncertainty principle, the future trajectory of that ball would be unpredictable. The future state of such a system would be, so to speak, holistically indeterminate, indeterministic. But the question that Putnam failed to ask is, is this un uncertainty ontologically or epistemic? Oh, is it ontological or epistemic? The problem is that, absent an interpretation of quantum mechanics, there is no way of answering this question. Yeah, as the, the, the this was the setup in the beginning. Is it Bohmium or is it Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics? So, how are we understanding um, what it is? Because in the Bohmium world, yep, see, we're going to get to that right here. All right, let me... Uh, not say something dumb and just get down to the smart stuff. This objection is devastating because Putnam's whole idea was that quantum mechanical indeterminacy is holistic at the macro level, that is, not traceable to atomistic events such as quantum jumps of single atoms, and therefore we could identify quantum mechanical indeterminacy with the insufficiency of efficient causation... <laughs> insufficiency of efficient causation to explain human choices postulated by libertarianism libertarians. 
but this clearly requires that the indeterminacy be ontological. So in other words, it has to be, this has to be like the way it really is. It can't just be that we think this is what our access to, it can't just be this is how we understand it. This has to be the way it really is. This is the question. Is this indeterminacy something we don't understand because that's the way it is? Or is it only because we don't have enough information about it? So, and Putnam needs it to be the way it really is for the brain to somehow get yourself into this macro level quantum state. It's not that we can't figure it out, but there is nothing to figure out. That's just how it is. Non-realist interpret yeah, and ask me questions if I didn't explain this well enough. Non-realist non-realist interpretations such as the Copenhagen interpretation do not pretend to tell one what is going on ontologically. Bohr thought that that was something the human mind couldn't know. The Copenhagen interpretation is strictly an epistemic interpretation. On the other hand, the currently proposed realistic interpretations are not holistic. Let's consider this question in more detail. So yeah, so this just says we don't know its position because it's something we can't know. That doesn't mean it doesn't have an actual position and momentum at any, any time. It's just something we can't know both at the same time to a certain degree. And that's different from saying they don't actually exist. It's just saying we can't know them. Okay. It is important to stress that Niels Bohr's famous Copenhagen interpretation does not answer ontological questions. It prohibits us from raising them. In Bohr's view, the human mind simply cannot grasp what is going on in quantum mechanics in the way that philosophers of science committed to scientific realism, including the present authors, demand. As Christopher Norris succinctly puts, only by adopting an epistemicist approach, one that sensibly acknowledges those limits of our classical concepts and categories when applied to quantum mechanics, could thought, could thought be prevented from creating all manner of needless problems, dilemmas, or antinomies. Thus, Bohr's philosophy of science can be seen as an admixture of Kantian and pragmatist themes, one that confines knowledge to the realm of phenomenal appearances, while quantum reality is taken as belonging to a noum, noum, noumenal realm that lies beyond the reach of any concepts we can frame concerning it, and therefore justifies the pragmatist equation of truth with what counts as such for all practical, predictive observations observational purposes so that's a mouthful but they just say look we are we are limited in our ability to analyze the physics any further that the copenhagen interpretation somehow is not really somewhat saying so much about the way the world is but by but says in some sense what our limitations are in interacting with the world and therefore we don't actually say anything about the world in this is just saying what the best physics can be and so we can't actually ask the question about these further questions about reality but it's um we only can talk about what we can see but then there's a further new new can't even say this anymore a further realm a kantian sort of thing that's beyond our reach you gooby what's up how are you i'm reading a paper on free will and quantum mechanics Feel free to ask questions. Um, sometimes I play Minesweeper, and sometimes I read random philosophy papers. So let me know if you have questions, and welcome to the stream. Bohr might thus be described as a mysterionist interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yeah. I mean, you might hear that quantum mechanics is very mysterious. This is the original uh, version of it, as Bohr's interpretation. Our originator. Some libertarians might indeed welcome the combination of Putnam's observation that chance is not a cause, and Bohr's claim that whether quantum mechanical chance is epistemic or ontological is a mystery we cannot fathom, but to both of the present authors, Bohr's mysterianism was simply an attempt to sweep the conceptual problems posed by quantum mechanics under the rug. Thanks, I'm just watching as I'm deciding to make breakfast. I mean, I'm determined to. That's right. And you are determined to eat those eggs and whatnot because the state of the universe says so. As Murray Gelman put it in his lecture to the 1976 Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College, Bohr brainwashed a whole generation of physicists. Yeah, this is people 
love Bohr's interpretation. They love, love, love Bohr's interpretation of quantum physics. And so this is uh, basically been canon for a while. <laughs> anyway, some of Bohr's successors, most famously Eugene Wigner, defended only for a time in Wigner's case the idea that consciousness reduces to wave pack reduces wave packets. This would work perfectly for libertarian purposes, since the reduction of the wave packet is the form that indeterminacy takes. According to this interpretation, it would follow that indeterminacy is associated with something mental ab initio. However, it seems to us and to almost all physicists, we may add that the predictions of quantum mechanics would just be would be just as successful if there were no conscious beings and all quantum mechanic mechanical experiments performed by automatic machinery. Huh. I don't know if I buy this because I don't know what you would mean by automatic machinery if that was completely separate from conscious beings. How would a conscious being, how would you know what an automatic machinery is if it was not in relation to a conscious being? So I already think there's something built into this concept uh, in term that refers back to conscious beings right there. But anyway... The subjectivist might reply that the automatic machinery would not exist except as a smeared out wave in the absence of conscious beings, but on this we agree with Einstein who, put, who told Putnam in 1953, look, I don't believe that when I am not in my bedroom, my bed spreads out all over the room, and whenever I open the door and come in, it jumps into the corner. Yeah, the world, Einstein was sort of realist about the world, but I mean, it seems a little, it seems very silly to say that when no one's looking, all that exists is sort of like a waveform. That's really, really pushing like the wave version of the world onto uh, it's sort of an ad hoc sort of generalization or uh, induction on the waveform that doesn't seem to be completely justified. Why would you think that something like a bed it changes when we don't look at it? <sighs> determined to make breakfast. I am determined to drink more of this, not grape juice. Okay. Putnam, 2005 and 2012, so we're getting closer to now, argues that if there is going to be a successful realist interpretation of quantum mechanics, it will have to be a spontaneous collapse theory. His example is GRW, or a pilot wave theory, but unfortunately neither of these theories exhibits holistic indeterminacy. Here are some details. First, because it is more straightforward, let's consider GRW. I apologize for not saying your folks' names. On the GRW interpretation, the local indeterministic events are either point-like flashes, J.S. Bell's preferred interpretation of GRW, or collapses of the mass of a particle into a very small volume, Girardi's mass density interpretation of GRW. Note that GRW, like the other interpretations, itself admits of more than one interpretation. You get seven philosophers in a room, you will get 23 opinions. On either interpretation, the uncertainties in the future of the whole system are ultimately produced by spontaneous collapses, the counterpart of quantum jumps we spoke of above in wave function terms. And these collapses start with single particles. No room for free will there, free or not free. No room for will there, free or not free. Yeah. Second, the classical Bohm interpretation. Yeah, see, this is the, uh, okay, that was what I was saying earlier, but before I shut myself up to get back to what they were saying. Second, the classical Bohm interpretation. This is whole, This is totally deterministic, as is the Everett DeWitt Many Worlds interpretation, by the way, which is actually deterministic, although to each observer it seems interpretable indeterministic yeah because this is um well let, let them say it. on the bohm interpretation the uncertainty principle is derived from our inability to know the initial distribution of the particles so to so the answer to our question in this case is the uncertainty is epistemic and this is the great point right here that this interpretation says the whole world is in some sense completely classical it's just like the balls bouncing around but at a certain point, we fail to be able to see the balls anymore bouncing around. And it's our inability to know, and that's what the uncertainty is. It's nothing to do with the world. It has more talking about us. So, how we know the world. 
However, the classical Bohm interpretation is not a field theory. The most straightforward way to make it a field theory is to introduce spontaneous creation and annihilation of particles. Now, the theory becomes probabilistic, but the stochastic element is again highly localized. In sum, the answer to the question, is the uncertainty epistemic or ontological? When applied to the most prevailing realist interpretations, is that, so far as we know, either the indeterminacy turns out to be ontological, but then it is not holistic since it can be traced to highly localized events, quantum jumps as it were, or else it turns out to be merely epistemo epistemological, as in the original Bohm theory or in the effort to fit do it many worlds interpretation. Either way, we don't get what the libertarian wants. And again, the whole point of this is to say, look, you can do weird things, but at a too small level. The quantum physics where this would work is too small, and then it looks like mini roulette wheels. And if you get too big, then it's these theories do not deal with anything big except at, at the epistemic level, what we just don't have access to. And so if you're going to do something at the big level, it's not what you want because it's just a question of like our failure to understand something and not really free will. And if you are trying to get something that we really might be indeterministic in the way we want, it's really at too small, at too, uh, um, it, it's just at one of these highly localized and not at the level of the brain, but like it's just too, uh, too particular to actually be of any use. Okay. And yeah, like I said, feel free to ask questions. We're getting towards the end though here, folks. Of course, one could go instrumentalist about quantum mechanics and say that ontological or epistemic makes no sense. But this move would bring us back to the spirit of the Koch-Benhagen interpretation, and we would hate to think that it gives anyone comfort vis-a-vis -vis libertarian free will. Yeah, so that's basically saying it's fundamental in that case, and then you're not getting any... Um, you're just declaring it the way you want it to be, and you're like, well, that's not really explaining anything. So it's not going to give you any comfort just to say, well, that's how it is. It's like, congratulations, you're free will, but then you can't say anything about it. <sighs> I think that's kind of what this last thing is. If you, this is the go nuclear version. It's like, well, you have free will, but you can't talk about it. Okay, oh, this is the end of the paper. So, compatibilism revisited. What seems more relevant to the free will issue than the proposed proposal that Putnam advanced in his 1976 lecture is a paper he published earlier, 1973, in which he argued that explanations seek their own level, and that, in particular, psychological explanations of actions and physical explanations of the bodily motions that are components of those actions can both be correct, that neither explanation renders the other redundant, and that neither gives the same information because the explanations do not generalize to the same classes, the same class of cases. Psychological experiments, in particular belief desire explanations, do show that the agent's choices are causally efficacious, and they thus exemplify both a significant kind of freedom and a rationale for holding agents responsible for their actions. This is, of course, in the spirit of compatibilism, and this and this seems to us to be the best that a liberal naturalist, that is, a naturalist who wants to be respectful of both the scientific and the manifest image of images of the world can do in the direction of satisfying our hunger for free will. So this is at the end. They're saying, look, everyone got to just go stay in their lane. You go stay in your lane and everyone's okay. Just stay in your lane, bro. Don't get out of it. The psychology deals with the free will and that's cool over here. The physicists deal with the physics stuff and the, bi like the biophysical stuff over here. And everyone stays in their lane and it's cool. When was this paper published? I kind of just go skeptical pragmatist on both uh, free will on quantum mechanics. But yeah, that's very explanatorily unsatisfying, of course. Yeah, um, this paper here, let me just flip back over to uh, Firefox. This is a 2020 paper, free will and quantum mechanics. This just came out in the Monist last year. Um, so it looks like they were having some sort of a issue on the philosophy of Hillary Putnam. And so this is a, uh, yeah, this is a 2020 paper. So yeah, it's a, uh, this is reasonably new. And what happened is it looks like they were reviewing um, Putnam's old argument that said libertarian, you can appeal to quantum mechanics. And, um, oh, that's right. He did die. Well, maybe it was in, uh, I forgot he died. Shoot. 
Yeah, now I'm sad. That's right. Uh, Hillary Putnam did die not that long ago, and maybe this was in his honor. Um, I don't know if he was putting it together or this was in his honor, honor or something like that. But yeah, that is also how long it... That is also a good point. This may have been in planning for the last 10 years and only just got published. Yeah, so... Th- yeah, this was in basically in... Um, reviewing an, a counter-argument to like Putnam's... Uh, 1976 or 1979 arguments that you could appeal to quantum mechanics in a holistic sense to give the libertarian in a way to resist the determinism of physics. So, yeah, you go skeptical pragmatists on both free will on in both free on both free will on quantum mechanics. But yeah, there's very explanatory and satisfying. Yeah, so this is basically they're saying you can't. In these authors' opinions, which is um, Hillary Putnam and uh, Mario DeCaro, you you're not going to be able to appeal to quantum mechanics to um, ground your libertarian free will, and so that f- makes them fall back into a compatibilism, which. I don't think anyone really likes compatibilism nowadays. Maybe they do, but it's still like people seem to like it. Actually, they. Uh, I don't understand why, but it maybe because all the other arguments are failing, and so this is just sort of a kind of a default position right now. I don't know, but yeah. So this is this is like I was just saying: stay in your lane, bro, and you're gonna be okay. You let the f- psychology people with their will do their thing, and that's how that science goes. And then the, the other science is the you know. They do their thing, and they don't always have to agree. But yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, see, what I was saying at the start, and uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm not, I don't like the concept of determinism that's actually used in science right now, so I deny that this is um the good way to go about talking about things. And so if you're going to deny the... Uh, understanding of determinism that we use in science now then you don't get you don't run into these problems but then then again you don't even have the question it's a completely different thing so you're not talking about uh determinism in terms of like true or false anymore because i don't think this is the right way of understanding the world i basically did not my myself deny um causal closure i don't see how you could argue for that in a physical uh in a naturalistic way it can only be argued for dogmatically and so i don't actually hold causal closure and therefore i deny that determinism makes sense in terms of uh science that's not to say we don't use it in terms of um our equations um have i read jen and ismail's position on free will i haven't managed to get my hands on her book how physics makes us free or whatever whatever it's called i have not read that um free will is not um, a topic I actually, I hate free will because of, for all the reasons I'm just saying now, I don't think it's framed well at the moment. And so I don't actually read so a bit about me. I don't deal with free will. Well, I don't like it. I don't like all these arguments because of these things. Do you deny causal closure? Because no, not at all. I deny causal closure on metaphysical grounds. I deny causal closure because I can't find an argument for it. I think people just assume it. I have not ever heard a good argument for causal closure. That's why I deny it. Or at least I abstain. What's up, Vikash Vishi? I appreciate your lurk. But yeah, so that's why I deny... I don't... um, Yeah, I've never heard one. I'm sure they might exist, but I just don't even care at this point. I'm just like... People have tried before, and I'm just like... And what's funny is last time... I remember clearly, like, I was talking to some people, and they were like, why do you deny this? I was like, because it's like, we were talking, like, I said, look, it's just dogmatic. And I, and then, like, they were asking me later about it. I was like, yeah, do you have any non-dogmatic arguments uh, for causal closure? And you could see their faces fall, because these are, like, good philosophers. They, they, they're not stupid. And I, it was just one of these questions no one had ever asked them before, and then they realized they didn't have anything to back it up. Like, they might have if they thought about it again, but, like, in the moment, they had nothing. They felt bad. I was like, yeah, I, this, that's what happened to me. I, I was asking myself this, and I was like, I have no idea. 
I haven't thought about causal closure for a while, but I have really, really strong intuition that if you change something, everything is affected in a sort of counterfactual way. Yeah, but see, now you're going strong on the counterfactuals. That's metaphysics. And that's not a scientific argument. And so, yeah, you can have metaphysical arguments for it, but... Yeah, I mean, try then you're doing metaphysics, and you got a whole different set of problems. So it's like, if you're going to do it um, scientifically, I think you're dogmatic. If you're doing metaphysics, you run into the problems with metaphysics. you got, like, excessive metaphysics by, dec by just declaring it. Or what, what would you... Here's the real problem. What could actually argue... What sort of argument could you construct that would end in the, therefore, there is causal closure? You could define counterfactuals in an empiricist way, but yeah, you see the problem. Okay, cool. I'm happy I, I make it a little bit of sense. But it's just I could not, for the life of me, come up with an argument that ended with, therefore, causal closure. Like, I couldn't think of anything that would be powerful enough, metaphysically even, to guarantee any sort of causal closure. You'd need a really, really, really strong argument to do that. And so I, I couldn't come up with one, and... I'm sure someone more clever than me has something smart to say on the matter, but like, I, I just, I've never come up with anything in that area. So this is my beef with, uh, just to say, that's kind of like where I'm coming at this for. I, I quite like this paper. In fact, I was saying earlier, I like the writing. I mean, this is on hard science topic and these are smart people and like there was almost no science here um like you were able to talk about interesting things in a very accessible way by going over a little bit of the history of the ideas the history of statistical mechanic uh, uh physics um which you don't actually need to say anything um in terms of equations the only equation they did was the history of where uh hillary putnam came up with the uh idea for the initial thought experiment. Uh, Ugubi says, you could instrumentalize causal closure in a way, naturalizing it such that you only talk about experimental counterfactuals. But yeah, that's not going to give causal closure in the way that metaphysicians and Phil Mind wants it. Yep. Yep. I'm not saying you can't use it, and it's a fine tool. But like, and we all do it all the time. But if you're going to talk about it as a metaphysical, like, fundamental thing, then you've got a whole different set of problems. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a good paper, I, and I can keep saying that, it's like, how do you get free will, um, and then you get to talk about free will, which is something that, in some sense, more people also want to talk about than just the philosophers of physics, philosophers of science and math want to talk about is something and you got aristotelian chance here to even get in a classical flavor on how we understand like chance as an agent within the system um yeah so so i had somebody in real life talking to me but can i i caught a bit of that just then yeah i'm just waxing poetic because you know at the end of the paper i try to go over what i like what i dislike this is a little bit of like a review show in some sense um, discuss what I like to discuss how the authors came to write a, the paper the way they did and so I like to talk about the arguments I'm more I like the arguments and so the idea that like you are going to argue um, for a physical conclusion uh, like in a metaphysical physical conclusion about quantum mechanics and you're going to be talking about Aristotelian chance and then like not, uh, as an agent within the system and then you're going to say well even in that case sure if that's your target but then they go on to say well that's kind of a straw man and they say look it wasn't even that it's more like millions of little roulette wheels going at once that's not an agent but you still don't want millions of little roulette wheels controlling what you do that's also not free will so this is kind of what we're going. And so what happened was Putnam tried to get out of that by doing some third thing, tertium quid. Um, but that required a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics, which then is shown to not actually hold. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I, well, I do like talking about the writing also. It's like, yeah, review some random papers and then... I also like talking about how a philosophy paper is constructed. Like, I just wanted to say again, this is the the whole bit of like all the uh, the formulas here. Just 
uh, Heisenberg's classic uncertainty um, formulation. So, okay. So you can't get the holism. And it's interesting that you can't get it because why? Because it fails the epistemic versus ontological distinction. All the holistic accounts are only epistemic and that's not what you want. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely different genres. This, like I was saying earlier, too, this is the exact sort of paper I would have been, like, super happy about a few years ago. I still like it a lot, but, like, I would have been like, this is the best paper I've read in, like, years, uh, years ago, but whatever. Okay, and then it shows that the metaphysical distinction between onto, uh, the ontological interpretation of quantum mechanics and the epistemic interpretation is really where this fails. Because you need to have an ontological interpretation to give yourself free will, to say free will is real, because that's ontological. But if you were using quantum uh, mechanics in an epistemic way, saying, well, it's quantum because we don't actually have access to it, but it's something else on its own, that's not what you want um, for free will. And so... I, again, like that you're, they're using a, an, well, I guess it's not accessible. It's accessible to someone like me who knows metaphysics, but it's a metaphysical argument showing why the physical argument, the physical um, interpretation can't work for free will. So, and then the very sad thing where they had to fall back to compatibilism happened at the end and they're like, stay in your lane, bro. The psycho, the people with free will can keep their free will and the people don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about it. Um, I'm very pleased with this paper. Um, the sort of thing that uh, it'd be better if there was more writing like this, at least in this area. Very accessible, I felt. Hmm, I think all the people on different links should talk to each other. Oh, they should definitely talk to each other. But like, if you're gonna say that one's right and the other was the like the one the people who say there is no yeah anti. Yeah, yeah, it, the stay in your lane, my my jokey gloss was more anti-reductionist metaphysics. That's exactly what this is. Um, they're just saying anti-reductionist here. Um, let me, they see, yeah, see, it doesn't, the explanations do not generalize the same class of cases. So that's the anti-reductionism right here, as you're uh, pointing out. So, keep, um, so one does not, one explanation does not generalize to the other one. So that's exactly what it is. It's an anti-reductionist argument. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, that's about it for this one. Um, let's see, what time is it anyway? Okay, it's not even that late. I could, maybe I'll just go play some Minesweeper after this, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for watching, and uh, has anyone fused panpsychism with this idea? Yes. Um, and I will not ref refer you to the paper that I read on this because I was so angry. That whole paper, I felt bad because um, they were basically attempting to use something. They were pa they were basically doing the um, yeah. So let me give you a quick loss. Let me get back up to where was that? Up here where they were said, where was my favorite? Um, obscure and per obscure, uh, obscurious. So you're explaining the obscure versus something even more obscure, uh, from something even more obscure. So let me run through that argument real quick. So what they were saying was free, not free will, but panpsychism. And so here's what it is. This is the Timothy O'Connor version of uh, agent causation, and I'm going to just use this as an example of what the other people were saying, but it has nothing. Timothy O'Connor, I don't have any idea if he's panpsychist or not, but let me just repeat, read this and I'll tell you what the other folks said. Having the properties that subserve an agent causal capacity doesn't produce an effect, rather it enables the agent to determine an effect within a circumscribed range. Whether, when, and how such a capacity will be exercised is freely determined by the agent. So what the panpsychists were saying was they weren't talking about agent causal capacity, they were saying the panpsychist sort of like um, interactions with the world was we had a quantum sort of uh, once you get to the level of the quantum uh, world, then within that world, we had a panpsychist causal capacity that we were allowed to do. And if you were, if if the 
quantum mechanical world gave us some sort of barrier that blocked the like that allowed us to interact with this panpsychist sort of causal thing then you could do it yeah um that is a, basically my reaction was just no don't do that just don't and uh like i said i don't want to put that view on anyone in this paper um but i did not like uh the panpsychist gloss on this i was just like in my review i said look when I was in school many years ago, I, my philosophy of science professor said, look, you can talk about quantum physics, but he was a philosopher of physics first, and then he started to get into philosophy of mind. He said, look, the quantum stuff is really small. It's not like it's small. It's like it's really small. And the idea that anything in quantum physics could work is just ludicrous in some sense on the macroscopic level. And that's what um, Putnam had to do here was – try to use a macro level quantum because it just is of a scale magnitude that makes no sense no of course it's an interesting ob option to find a physical um basis for panpsychism that would be fascinating but going to the quantum way is like um it's just too dangerous without getting your physics exactly right if you are not a good physicist you should not ever be appealing to physics don't do it. It's ju you're just gonna get it wrong. You're gonna misinterpret it, misinterpret it, misinterpret the physics, and the physicists will hate you. And then when it gets exposed, you're just gonna be like, oh well, I got the physics wrong, and then you're just gonna be wrong. Uh, yeah, this is like the Led Ladyman's Lego block intuition thing. Metaphysicians view the world like Lego when it's built up from little parts. Yeah, there are many people who uh, do Legos in uh, philosophy, basically. I was talking to a really excellent philosopher, and he said that's how he builds his uh, philosophy, is he gets himself, like, basically little pieces, and he builds himself castles. And that's what uh, his philosophy is, is he gets really sophisticated with very simple blocks. And the you, people go wrong is when they view the world that way that the world has to be the way they work and that's usually not the case i mean just you'd have to get dumb luck but yeah so you can do panpsychist in quantum physics uh arguments just don't screw i mean don't screw up the physics then and don't screw up your metaphysics and too many things can go wrong and that's why i don't like that stuff usually it's fine to con conceptually use little theory to build big theories, but not metaphysically small objects building big objects. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because why is uh, smallness important in some, in some sense? Why is small metaphysically good? It may not be. And this is sort of my anti-reductionist uh, uh, like bent there. Um, thoughts on grounding? Um, I've actually read a bunch of grounding papers on this sort of philosophy roulette. I am not, I don't love grounding. I'm not really a grounding person. Um, uh, what's that word? Uh, su supervenience 2.0 or whatever. I don't, I don't like supervenience either. Um, but you know, it does sort of, it's sort of a useful topic to talk about. I don't love it in itself. I kind of like what they do with it. Um, so I'm not hating on them. I, I don't like, I don't do it myself, but you know, I like their results in some sense. It's like, like, I don't always like what some people are doing, but I like how they, what they, what, what the results are. So who am I to complain about how the sausage is made? But yeah, that's kind of how I feel about grounding. <sighs> yeah. Used to ground, you were a grounding fan five years ago, but I think the interesting thing about it is hyperintentionality. But yeah, I agree, it's interesting to see the results. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to think more about hyperintentionality. I don't quite um, have my head around all of that, actually. But uh, Pretty Graham Priest and Ricky Bliss book is interesting. Yeah, full disclosure, I know Graham, so I've heard a good deal about it. I've even met Ricky Bliss once. So. Um, yeah, so do I have anything else to say about this? The idea is that two necessarily truths are true at all possible worlds, so it needs to be differentiated as impossible. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that stuff. Yeah, because you're distributing truth across all possible worlds. You see, 
I'm an oddball when it comes to this stuff. Um, so I, I know what they're saying there, but that's not my metaphysics. And so again, like I said, I don't deal, deal with that. But again, I like the, uh, they make hay with it. So it's like more power to them. But, uh, yeah. It's like not my cup of tea. The Marshall, what's up? You love this conference. I want to reattend when I can. <laughs> uh, how are you, the Marshall? <sighs> yeah. So this is one of the other things, and this was uh, also brought up was the uh, many world interpretation of stuff. Again, if you're gonna go many world interpretation with um this you don't get free will again because it's determined in every world but we just don't know which world we're in but that makes it epistemic and if it's epistemic it just means we don't know where we are but that doesn't mean it, there isn't a fact of the matter it always struck me as weird when people writing on grounding but force it to be a necessary modal thing and not just an ordinary how are things structured in the actual world yeah when are you going to upload it upload what um and so what are my metaphysics i uh don't do um the standard uh, sort of Kripke possible world things. Um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't have it all worked out, but the standard sort of like possible world picture, I don't buy that. Uh, yeah, I just don't. Uh, the whole propositions talk, possible worlds, eh, it's a little too much. Your deflation is about modality. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about um, making my position like particularly clear um, as of late, so I wasn't thinking about it. I just can't tell you. I'm not too tired. What am I going to... Uh, oh, upload this? You know what? If uh, DeMarshall, um, I actually have been uploading them reasonably. I'll email you the uh, private link. Um, yeah, uh, let me just write that down. So it'll be uploaded, but um, it won't be a public link because I've been real lazy about that. I was putting a lot of work into like tagging stuff and like emailing people. I'm getting sick of like tagging stuff and emailing people, but I'll upload it. Um, I'll, I'll send you the uh, whisper here, and that way you can go and check the uh, the vod. Um. <coughs> Yeah, your deflation is about modality. Yeah, well, see, exactly what is modality is the problem here. I'm not. I don't know if I'm even deflationist about it. I'm a deflationist about like all the possible worlds, but not necessarily about modality. Yeah, th yeah. Thanks for stopping about by Ogubi. I appreciate the uh, discussion. Because sometimes, you know, people come in, we have a little bit of chat. Sometimes people come in, they don't know what's going on. Sometimes people come in, and they do know what's going on. And that's fun, because then you get to uh, talk about all this stuff. Me? No. I was in grad school for a very short amount of time. I never liked school. It did not work out for me. So I, I just uh, do stuff. I'm in the New York City area, so I go to I went to a lot of uh, philosophy talks around town. Um, so that's all it kind of was. Yeah. Yeah. NYC might be one of the best spots in the entire world. I mean, there was so much stuff going on. You're an Australian. Okay. Fun. Yeah. So you would know Grand Prix then. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. He's a scholar. No COVID in my state. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, we have not been good with the coronavirus here. Although I can say I got my negative uh, test. I do not currently have coronavirus right here. He's a good guy. If you see him, you can say hi to him. He's nice. Uh, yeah, so I am actually, as of today, not sick with coronavirus. Yeah, so, um, I got like a bunch of viewers now. If anyone has any questions, uh, that happens, Ugubi. Yeah, academia is not good for your health. <laughs> All right, yeah. So here's a question, like, 
what exactly is free will, and then does it depend on hard determinism, or uh, all these other things? I don't know. Yeah, black build. I've been hearing that term more recently. It's like, you gotta you given up on the uh, vision. And do we understand what this Plato quote means from the beginning? No guardian spirit will cast lots for you, but you shall choose your own destiny. The blame is his who chooses. So I guess this is uh, Plato's version of free will. The blame falls to the person who chooses. So he who chooses gets the blame. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. No guardian spirit. You didn't undergrad, yeah. Oh, that's cool. I mean, that's the most I can, uh, I didn't even get an honors degree. Hell. That's the most I can claim to. I did take a lot of philosophy classes. A lot. I lived in the philosophy department when I was an undergrad. So. So, yeah, and now I know a bunch of stuff about... I know some things about some stuff. <laughs> okay, so what can we do now? I don't need to end stream. We could read a second paper, maybe. Um, yeah, so I know what we're going to do. Let's see if I can find a short one. I'm going to save this. We're going to go back to Firefox. And so let me add stream marker. I know a bunch of things about how philosophy is pointless. I also know a bunch of things about philosophy is pointless, too. We probably know the same stuff. <laughs> All right. And, uh, yeah. So, let's hit. Let's go back to the front page of Phil Papers. And this is the new stuff. So, we had this. We read the paper from the Monist. That was a lot of fun, I thought. Um, You see, yeah, this was like, you see, this is a... Uh, I don't know if you can see very easily, but it's Putnam here, Hillary Putnam, Hillary Putnam, um, Hillary Putnam's natural thing, so, uh, aspects of real numbers, Putnam, Wittgenstein, non-extinctionalism, uh, let's see, is there anything really short here? Let's find out. So this is an outline for a paper. How do you get your an, yourself an outline for a paper published? If you are David Lewis, you can get yourself a, a publish an outline for a paper. Um, wow. This outline for a paper which develops a compatibilist analysis. This is in the Monist. <laughs> this is this was published in the Monist. <laughs> uh, let's see what David. Le so this is not a crappy uh, journal. This is a good journal. <laughs> but if you're David Lewis, you can apparently do that. Let's see if we got this. Uh, we're going to load. We're going to load. Okay. So, okay. So this is literally an outline. So I maybe, all right, let's see what this is actually. Because maybe this is more like a, uh, Yeah. yeah. Although you're not allowed to say that word on uh, Twitch anymore, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this outline for a paper, which develops a compatibilist analysis of abilities, was completed by David Lewis during his sabbatical in the fall semester of 2000 in his... You're not going to get banned. No one's checking my channel. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's dated 20 January 2001. Let's see. Actually, do I even know how to ban uh, delete this? Ugh. I have no I Sorry, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Purge one second. Let's see if that did it. Clicky. Oh, 
Oh, God, they're all gone. Yeah, but they're in the video. <laughs> they'll be back. Like, they'll be saved in the video uh, of it. <laughs> Sorry, Gooby. <laughs> I apologize. Basically, that's it. Yeah, I'm a boomer. All right. Starting from the claim that it's a Morian fact. That, well, do you know how to delete particular ones? Yeah. The you do a philosophy unit? You know, I have papers on streaming. I've found papers on streaming. I keep forgetting to uh, read the papers about streaming on stream. I want to do that. People talk about the uh, ethics of speedrunning. And also... Oh, I have to go check if he got this published or if he didn't. But he, uh, another one was on the different types of uh, the aesthetic values. More in fact, I'm out. <laughs> Starting from the claim that it's a more in fact, morally obligatory, yes. Starting from the fact that it's a more in fact that we are often able to do otherwise, Lewis provides a simple proof of compatibilism. Why would it be more in fact that we are often able to do otherwise? How would you even, like, yes, we are all, why, why is that a more in fact? He then presents his own account of abilities. S is able to do A, if and only if. There are no obstacles to their A-ing, where an obstacle is a robust preventer, something that would or does cause S to not A, and which wouldn't go away if things were just a little different. What? Is he just saying that free will is a Morian fact? Isn't that just question begging? That's kind of what it looks like because you're declaring the one thing you need to be a Morian fact. And if you're declaring the one thing you'd be a Morian fact, that's just basically saying the one thing you need is a fact and you're not going to justify it because it's that's what calling it Morian fact is. And so, well, let's see what the sample proof of compatibilism. So it's not really an outline, it's a sample proof, and that's why it got itself published. It's a Morian fact that we often have a choice what to do. So I can drink this or I can drink this. Yeah, formatting is nice. It's a Morian fact that we often have a choice what to do. We're able to do what we do, also what we don't do. But whether determinism holds is an unsettled question. It depends on whether a collapse hypothesis is true physics. Collapse hypotheses have theoretical advantages and drawbacks. Probably the best of them is GRW. So having free choice is epistemically compatible with determinism and with indeterminism. So it's, some, so it's compatible simpliciter. Are there impossible epistemic possibilities, alleged precedents, are relevant to this case, mathematical or logical ignorance, the geography of the pluriverse, necessity a posteriori. So we need a compatibilist analysis of ability. 2. The conditional analysis is unsatisfactory. Alright, actually let's go look, let's go back and, did I actually say anything here? Um, so if we have a choice of what to do, um, and then it's undetermined whether determined holds is an unsettled question. We don't know that. Um, the fact that since we don't know this and it's a factor of choice, then free choice, not free will, but free choice is epistemically compatible with determinism, especially because determinism is a big old question mark. And so if it's compatible with determinism, it's also compatible with indeterminism because why wouldn't it be? So it's just compatible simpliciter. So just in itself it's metaphysically possible to to hold. And so, therefore, because it's metaphysically possible, we need an analysis of it? I don't really think that follows, but, I mean, you could want one. I don't know about you needing one. Um, and that, again, is based off, you've defined yourself. What if free choice was compatible with determinism and not indeterminism? Um, that would be interesting, but I don't know if anyone actually... Um, cares about that position because um, people care about it being compatible with determinism and then do they would they care if um, 
you know, they only care about determinism. I don't know if they don't care about indeterminism, but I then again, if you are going to be compatible with determinism, I don't know how it would, would be incompatible with indeterminism if it was also compatible with determinism. So you'd have to give an explanation of uh, how free choice and indeterminism fail to be compatible. Okay, so again, more in fact, then you need a, an analysis of this fact is basically it. And if determinism doesn't really, it doesn't affect it, um, then again, you're just saying, well, why does it matter here? And then you just want an analysis of this fact. I think the question will premise here is that Compatibility with determinism entails compatibility with indeterminism. I don't think that's a proof of compatibilism being true, vice versa, you mean. Um, no, you're right about that. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I don't know. The thing is, it's like, why, if it's compatible with indeterminism, should it be palatable? determinism or not and and he's saying here at least in this bit it, it like it's not even settled and so it doesn't even matter in some sense it's like they kind of like they're distinct questions so it's like the fact that they remain as distinct questions means you want to know what uh the ability to choose otherwise is it with respect to either of them because they seem to be distinct now does one or the other um how do they interact yeah then you're gonna have to get into the nitty-gritty of compatibilism and in, uh, determinism or indeterminism well this is an outline he did say it was an outline not a uh, proof simple proof of compatibilism yeah maybe that's a uh, using the word proof here is a little bit uh overblown but what are we proving then either? We didn't uh, prove, it didn't specify what he was proving. All right, so let's get back to the, uh, <coughs> let's see what he's actually trying to do. The conditional analysis is unsatisfactory. I would have if I had chosen to. Alternatively, if I had tried, if I had wanted to. Same difficulties will arise. Not Pache Austin. Could have if I had chosen. What's conditional on choice is not one's ability, but whether that ability is worth mentioning. Uh, see biscuits on the sideboard if you want some. You're asking, I like the idea that this is how Lewis writes poetry and that David Lewis' foundation was confused about whether this was for a philosophy or a poem. Yeah, this was meant to be a poet. Like, this isn't wrong journal this should have been like a poetry journal i forget what cf stands for i mean it means compare the uh biscuits on the sideboard if you want one um so like if you want one if you had chosen you would have a biscuit but you should compare yeah objection finkish disposi dispositions to finkish dispositions to succeed if you tried, you'd lose your previous ability. For example, to overcoming sick stammer, don't try too hard. Best chance of success is to say something spontaneously. CJ is rating. <laughs> CJ, CJ, how are you, CJ? Uh, what were you doing? Minecraft, Minecraft raid incoming. How was your How was your stream, CJ? I saw you were. Uh, on the Minecraft grind earlier. <coughs> oh, you got a new computer! Congratulations! I, that's awesome. I need to get myself a new computer too. Um, thanks for the raid. <laughs> I mean, I'm reading this um outline of a proof of uh <laughs> outline of Neil Obstat an analysis of ability. It's a simple proof of compatibilism, and it's just this uh. Oh, apparently what happened was this very famous philosopher sort of outlined a proof and never did anything with it and they're publishing it now for uh, whatever and um, so we're just reading it just for a little bit of fun I was going to end my stream earlier but then like we had some people here talking so I was like let's just go do a little bit of yeah whether free will is compatible with determinism basically if the universe is like Minecraft and it's like in a computer and everything's determined 
then how do you have free will? Well, are you outside the computer controlling it or what? So this is basically what this is on. Are we in the matrix or not? Are we controlled or not? And can we get bust out like Neo? So here's the question. And can we prove it? And basically what this person's saying is like, you can choose to do stuff. And that's a fact. You, everyone can choose to do stuff. And when there's a little bit of problem there, is that begging the question or whatever? But you can choose to do stuff, you know? It's like, okay, well, you gotta take that seriously. And then all the other stuff about the physics, you know, the physics is less certain than the fact that you can choose to do stuff. So if you look at it from what have you in your life understood and everyone else's life, the fact that you can choose to do stuff is more certain than the physics because the physics has to be based on these everyday things anyway. The real question is that if we're in a simulation, can we speed run it? I don't know about you are, but that's what I'm doing. I feel like I'm 800 right now. I've run this so many damn times. So, yeah. So this is kind of what we're reading. But congratulations on your your first stream with your new PC. Hopefully it'll run Minecraft well. <laughs> and everyone out there, feel free to ask questions. My first time reading this stuff, I just have a good time with it. So, and thanks again for the raid. Yeah, so the question is, if you... If we're taking from position that we have a choice of what to do, and it's still questionable exactly how physics works, we have to still then we have to really say how do these two things work together, and that's where we're at. And this is sort of in the outline. How do we get to this point where we have to sort of figure out what do we say? Oh, have a great night, CJ. Good luck with the news. <laughs> it's been an overly exciting uh, week. Thanks again for the raid. All right, so we've got a conditional analysis of is unsatisfactory. And I was told to read this like it was poetry. I would have if I had chosen to. Alternatively, if I had tried, if I had wanted to. Same difficulties will arise. Not Pak Jai Austin could have if I had chosen. What's conditional on choice is not one's ability. But whether that ability is worth mentioning. C. Biscuits on the sidebar, sideboard if you want some. Objection. Thinkish dispositions to succeed. If you tried, you'd lose your previous ability. For example, to overcome a stammer, don't try too hard. So, thinkish dispositions is one the uh, sort of overturning. Well, and was he British? I mean, he's probably just talking about cookies. Um, and I don't blame him for talking about cookies. I like talking about cake myself. Um... So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good um, example in philosophy is to talk about cookies. Because who doesn't like cookies? For example, to overcoming a stammer, don't try too hard. Best chance of success is to say something spontaneously. <laughs> he goes on about crackers. I haven't read them, but I should read that. I don't remember. Or maybe I didn't. I don't remember. But that happens. Objection. Thinkish dispositions not to succeed. If you tried, you'd gain an ability you now lack. For example, the victim of Frankfurt's neuroscientist. It's a dialogue written with his wife. Maybe she was the good writer. Who knows? Objection. Success sometimes takes luck as well as ability. I mean, how is that an objection? I guess. It's because you're not actually in control of what you're doing then. Lloyd can kick goals of if anyone can, 109 last season, but even if he doesn't always succeed, 60 behinds, his ability does not desert him when he's unlucky. Well, as the, the old saying goes, you have to be good to get lucky. If you're just crappy, you're never going to score anyway, so you have to be good and you put yourself in the position and then luck can help. That's a possible hypothesis, but unlikely. Somebody might have the ability even if chance of success is low. If others, chance was, excuse me. If others, chance was much lower still. Even if I have some minute chance of kicking a goal, but I'm not able to do it. Objection: Some obstacles to success are obstacles to choosing too. For example, post-hypnotic su uh, suggestion, compulsion, maybe also decisive coercion. Okay, so what, what's going on in this section? It says, if. 
the whole point here is this this if a conditional analysis this is the if right here that's conditional what work is it doing if you had chosen to so the idea is that like there's a condition here and then you're deciding to choose and these are all objections saying look that's not what it is to be in free will to give yourself a conditional right there the if because that's not what we mean by free will that it's a conditional what it is is that you could decide like you could decide to do something stupid and that's not free will like why is it worth mentioning or you could do something that would interfere with your own ability to make decisions and these are the finkish dispositions and so you could choose to do something that would either give you a new uh, a new ability or take away your ability and in doing like being able to choose that sort of thing means that that's not what we mean by uh, free will or um, the ability to choose that's not what we mean by that so and so again like if it was just like if you were dependent on luck again that's what this one here is saying if you're dependent on luck that's not what we mean by free will either because the idea is that you're still choosing, even if luck is involved, but then you don't have to talk about luck where you still just want to talk about uh, your ability to choose. So that's the sort of thing. It's not this conditional because there's too many problems talking about conditionals with respect to uh, the ability to choose. So this is a compatibilist analysis of free will he, he's rejecting. Yeah, analyzing free will as purely modal is just saying in actual words that's deterministic there are modal statements about possibility yeah um i think that's right but again um it's kind of like we still haven't gotten away from his premise um there's a compatibilism analysis and like this one here is what he's he doesn't like this so it's like yeah okay so after this is this sort of compatibilism he doesn't like, these sort of analysis he doesn't like, we're going to get ourselves a fresh start. Ability if and only if no obstacles. So we're going to get ourselves... <laughs> you want to know why he didn't publish this? Because it ain't going to get no better. <laughs> but that doesn't make it any... I mean, we're reading it because it's fun, not because we're going to get... And it's kind of interesting, not because he's going to actually have a great conclusion on this one. If he had a great, great conclusion on it, wouldn't it would have already been published. You don't always publish the things you think you're going to publish. Granted, if you're David Lewis, you have some crappy throwaway thing, you can still get it published. Fresh start. Ability if and only if no obstacles. For the case of basic actions, the case of generated actions is derivative what's this question marking i don't know what that is if your ability to question mark if and only if for some basic action it probably means phi so your ability to phi that's how they they do this now so he probably just did this as a shorthand but this looks like doing it would be would be phiing so like uh it's a placeholder for a function for something you could do if your ability to question mark to phi, if and only if for some basic action, so your ability to walk for something, your ability to things. Yeah, so that's what I think that would have been here um, in sort of question marking, so actioning. Doing it would be phi -ing. For example, doing it would be causing so-and-so. Like, so if you're, if you're going to go, you're able to do that for some ba basic action, so doing it would be walking. So doing would be doing would be causing so and so. So you're you're causing yourself to walk. For example, doing would be breaking your promise. Okay. So there's something else you're like. Well, I promised I wouldn't go for a walk, and then I did. And there's no obstacle to doing it. So no one's stopping me from going for a walk. Must you know which basic action that is? Ambivalence. Sometimes we think yes. Inability to open a combination lock. All right. So you said you'd go somewhere, but you can't. Um, but you have to know about this lock. Sometimes we think no. The secrets could be even safer. If not only did you know the combination, but also you were unable to open the lock, say because it's on a timer. Okay, so it's uh, you're, you're supposed to rob a bank, but the lock only can be opened at certain times. And so it's not just that you know the way to get in, but you are constrained in other ways. So you have to be able to do the thing you need to do 
in terms of no other constraints. But that's not a... We, this, I don't think anyone... I don't know of anyone who said otherwise. I mean, if you have free will to do something, you can choose. The idea is that you have the choice. It really is a choice. It's not that there's something going to block your choice. The point is that you actually can do it. The secrets could be safer. In Lewis in 2000, he sounds more like a QAnon. Um, yeah. This is, uh... Well, there were definitely conspiracies uh, 21 years ago, too. So, there were crazy conspiracies back then. There were in the farther in the past. And there are now, and there will be in the future. So, there's nothing uh, unusual about that, really. <laughs> So, but okay, so now we don't even know what an obstacle is. So it's not just not knowing the combination to a lock of something you have to open up, but what is an obstacle? Your favorite conspiracy is modal realism. Well, you could say that your favorite conspiracy is basically any philosophy. Um, you got a whole bunch of people who believe it for probably no good reason. It just makes them feel good. What's an obstacle? An obstacle is a preventer, because everyone knows what a preventer is. Awesome, let's make up some words. Yeah, roast. <laughs> uh, a preventer would cause you not to do something. Incompatible, normal, incompatible, incompatible normal logically or simpliciter with you doing it. So it's like law-like. The laws of nature, in a causal way, are incompatible with you doing it. Not necessary. What type of chancy preventer? Not sufficient. That covers a reliable trace of the action or a reliable trace of a genuine preventer. Also covers the future tense fact that you won't do it. So, this is the chancy preventer is like you are only able to do it, uh, you know, on certain coin flips. Like, or like if you had like a you had to win a hand of poker or something, and you could just get a really bad hand every time. So. You don't need to go like chancy. You don't need to go something um, covers a reliable trace. I don't know exactly what he means by reliable trace here. Um, but like something else could be doing it. Like something uh, de a derivative of the action could be, could be preventing you. But who knows? Also covers the future tensed fact that you won't do it. So if like you had a statement from the future that you don't do it, would that prevent you now from doing it? Like, so a uh, future Noger does not read the next sentence, and we somehow knew that was true. Does that actually stop me from reading it right now? That's all of that's unnecessary. It just is something that would cause you not to do something. The way in which that happens is not so important right now. It's not a question of how. It's a question of uh, what. And so that's kind of what's going on here. And Lewis is just sort of outlining the what it actually means to be a what, not a how. Okay. Many preventers are obstacles, shackles are, paralysis is, being dead is, lacking the strength is, not being on the spot is, not having the tools for the job is, lacking sufficient funds is, post-hypnotic suggestion is, compulsion, for example, phobia is, depression is, being interfered with is. Some preventers are not obstacles, being unlucky isn't, not if it's chancy, not even when minute details predetermine that you'll fail predeterminers of preventers that aren't obstacles aren't. Hypothesis. An obstacle is a robust preventer. One that wouldn't go away if things were just a little different. Okay. So basically, going on the what. It's not something that's just unlucky because we ruled that out above. Chancy or some sort of like itsy little thing. Those don't count. We're talking about big things that would blo would outright block you deciding to do one thing or another. Um, and we're discounting these sort of... You're cutting off these sort of things that you already have taken into account in some sense. These are things are, that are taken into account. Just bad luck is taken into account. All these other things are things that could causally affect you. This stuff is sort of non-causally, just sort of the way you understand this is part of the world, and you're already sort of understanding that in the background. But these are sort of uh, background issues. These, some, in some sense, have to matter. Okay. Alright, so then if you remove those obstacles, 
Something is an obstacle so long as it persists. The philosophers in their persistence. Ivan Sean want to become famous by followers, primes, viewers on that big follows. Now, this guy does need to be timed out. You know what the funny part about this? Every time I read it, I always read Big Flowers. And, uh... I really wish, like, I could just buy flowers for people via, like, chat on Twitch. That would be, like, great. Like, you know? Um, why can't I just, like, buy big people flowers and send them flowers through chat? Wouldn't that be cool? Like, really? I'd love to be, like, get flowers sent to me or send people flowers just by, like, uh, clicking on chat. It's awesome. You know, I almost, I, I really don't have the time or money. Well, I have, like, a, a few bucks. I want to buy, like, bigflowers.com and then, like, spam that in people's chats and be like, I'll send you flowers. <laughs> like, people would click on it for the memes. They really would. I'd probably make a, a lot of money. Yeah, send CJ flowers for raiding me. <coughs> oh, definitely. Look, basically any everything I do gets more views than philosophy. And I've got like a bunch of people here now, and I thank you all for being here. Like, thanks. It's cool. Like, ask me questions. It's cool. Um, whatever. But uh, appreciate it. But yeah, philosophy is not the. Uh, <laughs> there is me and this. Uh, Guy Aristotle, and as far as I know, we're the only two uh, people streaming philosophy on Twitch. But uh, you should go. What if they're all spam bots? Welcome spam bots. Uh, learn something. They came with a raid mostly, so whatever. It's cool. <coughs> you know, computers, uh, machines need love too, Ugubi. All right, removable obstacles. Something is an obstacle so long as it persists. No, there are philosophy streamers, kind of. There's debate shows, but there's, I mean, the only other guy I know who, like, will sit and read philosophy, and he doesn't do it too much. Um, you might get into philosophy streaming on YouTube. That's cool. There's a bunch of good people on YouTube, but um, there's a... He's not in chat right now. But I'm pretty sure that's his handle. He's a professor of uh, he teaches ethics and so like he'll he'll sit around reading uh Marcus Aurelius on stream. So There's no obstacle. Okay. Something is an op Kane B is going to YouTube except his political views. Okay, good to know. Um what's his name? Mark Jago is on YouTube, and if, like, you want, like, actual hardcore, like, he, he's not doing, like, reading papers like me, but he talks about, like, straight-up logic, and, like, he just put out a, um, an argument on, like, definite descriptions. Um, <laughs> um, he's not analytic, he's an Aristotelian. Um, he's a virtue ethics guy. <clears throat> yeah, but Mark Jago, I, uh, I like him. He does attic philosophy, look up attic philosophy on youtube and uh he yeah he just put out i was gonna watch it earlier definite descriptions on that he is a bit better than jago's but jago is cool he's probably saying he got more views i'm surprised jago didn't get more views too i don't i've seen k i haven't looked at kane b in a, a very 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 long time and so i don't remember the stuff he's putting out or whoever kane is they put out um, I just, no, I, I see Jago puts out good stuff and I'm like, why does it not have more views? <coughs> I'll let him know. I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's got a jingle. Okay. Something is an obstacle so long as it persists, but I'm able to remove it. Then it stops becoming an obstacle if it. So, things that are obstacles to choice can be removed and then you regain your choice? Okay. There's no obstacle to some action that would cause it to vanish. Must I know what that what action that is? Ambivalent as usual. I'm not able to do the thing right away. 
but I'm able to remove the obstacle and then do it. Lacking a skill I'm able to require is a removable obstacle. How do you know you're able to require it then? I don't know. So we're ambivalent about whether lack of skill is an obstacle. Excuse me. For example, can I shed my accent? Yes, but only after long practice. Likewise, lack of strength. For example, can I lift a certain weight? Yes, but only after a course of exercise. Likewise, insufficient funds. For example, can I buy this? Yes, but only after saving up for it. So, an obstacle is something is an obstacle so long as it persists. So, the whole point here, I guess, is that there is a so long here. This, like, so long as it persists. So, this is the if it persists. This is really a conditional. So, objects of uh, those the uh, obstacles that prevent choice, those do have a conditional analysis. You're not following where we're at right now. You know what the problem is with this? This is really an outline. This was not meant for uh, public consumption. He's All he's doing here is he's trying to get clear on what is going on if you want to have a compatibilist version of a choice. So he's saying, look... You have your choice, as we were talking about earlier, and then you say, look, these things are not problems for choice. You say, well, what is a problem for choice? It's an obstacle. And then he's talking about, well, you can, if you have a choice, the obstacles can't be, um, they, they have to be removable. If you have free will, there can't be a choice that makes it completely impossible. So he's talking about what is it to be metaphysically removable because... You have to be able to have the choice metaphysically for it to be free will, a free choice, and therefore what is it to be metaphysically removable for something that sort of blocked that choice, but only tempor temporarily. And that's what it, this whole thing here is, I was just saying. So, yeah, is this, th this is just sort of an outline of the ideas, and that's why it got published as an outline, because they know it's not a proof, Who whoever was getting this published. They didn't want to call it a proof because this is really an outline of how certain ideas have to be the sort of like the concept of what has to be the terrain that has to be mapped. That's what this is. How, what is the metaphysics of removing a, uh, something that was blocking your free choice? Because it has to only be a potential obstacle, not a permanent obstacle. A permanent obstacle means you didn't have the choice. A potential obstacle means it's removable. So this is a potentiality argument. And that's what you can see that right here. Can you do this? These are all uh, possible modal possibilities here. So that's what's going. Yeah, that's exactly why I got published because it is interesting to see how he was ma mapping this out. Okay, is preferring not to an problem is I don't know what he means half the time. I have to figure this out after the fact. Is preferring not to an obstacle? What? All right. Sometimes no. I'm able to. I'm able to order lager, though I prefer bitter. Not if psycho psychophysical causation is chancy, and not if it's deterministic. Being predetermined to prefer not to also isn't. Okay, so this is asking, is your choice, you say you have a free choice, but then you also have a preference. And so then do you really have a choice if you have a long-standing preference? Well... This is one of those, when you get to see how the sausage is made, people don't, just because they write in an analytic way, that doesn't mean that's actually how philosophy works. And I, I feel this. Um, yeah, we're even getting German. I, whenever I'm doing work, I, the output is analytic. That doesn't mean that's how I think about the stuff. A lot of times I'm thinking in terms of like other ideas. So... The fact that this isn't as analytically formatted at the moment, I mean, that's fair. Evan Gao, how are you? Were you cooking today in a maid's outfit? Because I was watching that for like a few seconds and then like I had other stuff to do, but I think you were cooking in a maid's outfit. Yes, you were. I hope you your food was tasty. Okay, so this is now... We were talking about obstacles that are removable. Now, the question is, is your preference in your head that you prefer something? Oh, I'm happy your food was good. Hope you're doing well. 
I have channel uh, reward points now. You can actually get channel... Um, if you guys get channel points, you can make me do stuff now, apparently. I have not actually had anyone re redeem any channel points. Now that I say that, it's probably going to happen, but yeah. Hundreds <laughs> do philosophy in a made outfit. I don't have a made outfit. If you want to send me yours, Evan, I'll consider it. Um, hydrate. Cheers. <sighs> okay, so is preferring kind of an obstacle? Because if you have a preference for a certain kind of beer, then did you really have a choice to choose a different beer? Posture check. Um, jeez. Posture's okay, actually. And we also got to hydrate. Thank you, Evan. And thank you, Ugubi. Yeah, I'm actually not sitting that bad. So, this is question... So, this is question. If you have internal structures in your body, like in your mind, are those obstacles? Or are they something else? So, it's like, well, you have free choice to drink this or that... But then if you always prefer one thing, do you ever really have the choice? So this is the question. So being predetermined to prefer not to also isn't. So if you prefer one thing, these are not... So sometimes no. Is it not an obstacle? Eh, you're able to order one thing even though you like the other. So you can go against your preference. And sometimes yes. I'm not going to attempt German. <coughs> but anyway... I can't. I've promised not to. I can't. He's holding a gun on me. I can't. I'd go to jail. I can't. I'd lose my job. I can't. It would bankrupt me. So, sometimes, yeah, you can't, like, it, the cost of the preference, of going against your preference, is too high. And so, in that case, it, the, it would turn into an, it would turn into an obstacle that was non-removable. But sometimes, no, despite the same considerations. All right, so, Something, you, something, if God himself commands me to. So, like, if uh, God commanded you to uh, take the life of your son, then would you do that, as uh, was in the old biblical story? So, in something that you normally couldn't do, but if God himself commands you to, then maybe you can. I can break my promise to obey if I'm ordered to shoot hostages. Yeah, so if you promise you do something, but if it's completely morally heinous, you might decide not to. I can face death rather than shoot hostages, or jail, or unemployment, or bankruptcy. So these are preferences you have, but you can still override your very strong preferences given certain situations. Um, yeah, the Wittgenstein, I think, would be better. I don't know too much about Lewis's life, but I mean, Wittgenstein, you'd have, like, war. I mean, he Wittgenstein got a... Uh, Medal for Bravery, he went out and did the advanced scouting. So he was, like, going and looking. He was, like, the person that would go up and look to see where they would go. And so he was the first person that would, was most likely to get shot. He got an a, a award for bravery. Yeah, I think he was just suicidal. Like, half his family was suicidal. I don't actually know if he was brave or just wanted to get, to get shot. Um, <laughs> I know that's kind of horrible to say, but, like, Half his family killed him. They killed themselves, and so he may have just been doing suicide by, via war. But yeah. <coughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah, but see, I think it would make much better TV. I don't know anything about Lewis's life, but like Wittgenstein, I mean, he was rich. They could show all the famous people that came to his house when Wittgenstein was in the. Uh, yeah, well, they they were yeah. When Wittgenstein was in the what was it World War One, he got captured and was in a um, POW camp, and some other people were in the POW camp, and you know they're just milling around doing stuff, and there there were some art critics in the POW camp. <laughs> the story's hilarious, and they were talking about like one of the like famous artists of the day, and Wittgenstein was like, oh yeah, that picture of my sister. And they're like, what do you mean that picture of your sister? They were talking about a famous artist that his dad had, like, that t painted his sister because, like, he was so rich that the artist was, like, over his house. And, uh, yeah, like, this happened. And so they were like, who the hell are you that you were so rich that you were, uh, 
Yeah, they pick my sister. It's exact like that that happened. And so they were like, What are you doing here? That like he volunteered for the uh military and so he was in the military. Yeah. So I mean you gotta give him some credit. He he did volunteer for like forward combat and he could have gotten out of it. He was that wealthy. So again, I'm not saying his mental state on that. Uh, yeah, Wittgenstein's conversation with Russell. Yeah, and that was a stormy relationship at times. So uh, the Wittgenstein uh, would definitely make a TV show. I didn't actually read. They had a. Uh, they've. I think they have done some like a uh, biography movies on him. But I I always fear that they're trying to do too much of the philosophy, which is not gonna really work uh, very well. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the thing. If you're going to do Wittgenstein, they always try to incorporate the philosophy, and that makes it very hard. But, like, his life, on the other hand, he was rich, he knew famous people, like famous musicians, famous artists, and then he went off to war, He then he, you know, he traveled around, then he would, like, go run off into the woods in uh, Norway or whatever for a while. They should do the philosophy, but they're inevitably, inevitably going to mess it up. It's not easy philosophy. Okay. <coughs> So, here's the thing. Even if you have preferences, can they block your choice? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And then even when you think they're going to block your choice, sometimes you can even override those. Is Tyrus to consult on it? Yeah. <laughs> no one asked me nothing. <laughs> so, preferring not to is at any rate a preventer. So yeah, so sometimes your preferences can block your choice. Whether it's an obstacle depends on the balance of pros and cons. Whether it's overwhelmingly con, preferring is not to an obstacle. Preferring not to is an obstacle. When it's delicate, not. How delicate is delicate? That's indeterminate. So when do you actually get to choose what you want and when you don't want? So when do you choose one beer versus another one? Eh. No, oh, no, that's fine. Ask questions. This is what the robustness hypothesis predicts. An overwhelming balance is a robust preventer. A delicate balance isn't. But yeah, but what's robust then? I don't know what that is. Robustness hypothesis. So at a certain point, you lose compatibility because you are overwhelmed. So you have a robust choice up to a, a point. Complication. We sometimes flatter ourselves. We pretend we're less predictable than we are. Hence, that balance, that balances are more delicate than they are. For example, my balance for bitter, lo, bitter over lager may be overwhelming, and hence a robust preventer of my of ordering lager. But I or others may pretend otherwise. Yeah. So this might be overblowing that we actually have choice in the face of our preferences. Perhaps our preferences always do win out, and we're just, uh, we like to think we have free will, but we don't actually. So, the question is, um, what I'm, whenever I'm choosing to drink, do I actually have a choice there, or is it just my uh, unconscious preference really just bubbling to the surface, and although I think I'm choosing... Um, it's not really a choice. And one of the interesting things about that is they've done, I saw this, this is not that new anymore. A few years back, they were doing like brain scans of people making a choice and they were able to see in the brain that the choice in some sense had been made before the person sort of consciously realized that the choice has been made. Now, granted, that might just have been the reporting on it. The, the reporting on the conscious decision was made after the decision was made and didn't actually correlate, but it seems that they were able to like notice that the brain had already made the decision before the person actually knew it. I don't know exactly how much we can rely on that sort of thing, um, but yeah. So the question is, is preferring not to an obstacle? So you really need like brackets on this. Is Preferring not to. That's how it's supposed to be grouped. So yeah. So do I prefer to read philosophy in a maid's dress? No, I don't. Will I do it for stream? Depends what stream gives me. Like, if it was worth it, maybe. 
people buy a lot of weird stuff. So, okay. So, what's interesting about this paper, this little itsy outline, is that it is an outline. And so, what is this? He then presents his own account of abilities. So that is really what's interesting here. I don't know if we have any sort of proof of compatibilism other than he thinks that choice is a Morian fact. And that, by definition, is just saying, this is how the world is. Um, but the account of abilities here is kind of the interesting uh, part of the paper. This first part is like, fine, is kind of a warm-up to uh, what's coming afterwards. And so when an obstacles, yeah, see, even the... Uh, whoever put this um, abstract is, also understood this robust preventer theory is where it would have eventually had to go. Yeah, so it wouldn't go away if things were just a little different. So what exactly counts as a block on free will, on the ability to choose? A robust preventer would do that, but not everything is a robust preventer. So, but we don't know what that is. So what happened here is, set it up with this sort of proof of compatibilism. Not much of a proof, not much of a compatibilism, but it sets up the question about what our abilities are. And then we've got this whole bunch of stuff on what our abilities, and that's also a good question. Um, so it's not just a, what's it called, the a conditional saying if something happens. And that's the sort of thing that we can do, is that we have the ability um, to conditionalize. We also have the ability to conditionalize, but that's not really what we mean by choice. Because we can di conditionalize all sorts of ways that isn't what we really mean by choice. And then, okay, talk about that. Then if you have complete freedom, the ability to do stuff if there are nothing in the way, and then what counts as something in the way of choice, and then what if it... it the whole point of being able to do something means that the... Things that can get in your way can be removed. What is the metaphysics of being removed? And then, what if the problem is in your head? And how are you actually able to understand your preferences? Can you remove your own preferences? Can you, when you decide to do something, is it your preferences just deciding not your free will? And can then you refer, can you remove a preference? Can you change your preferences? And here's the thing, it's like, Lewis is saying, look, there are some really, you normally you say no, but even then, maybe you can. Like, given certain circumstances, you might be willing to die then, uh, in, in, in certain circumstances and change your preferences. Like, you may have said you were going to do something, but you, instead you decide, look, I'm not shooting the hostages. I, I'd rather get myself killed than kill all of those people. Okay. But that may say you prefer not to uh, betray your friend. But you know what? If it, betraying your friend is what uh, is required to save a bunch of people's lives, maybe you'll do that. Cool. So the question is, what does it take? Um, how do you? How could we even do this analysis of abilities when we have these things that we think of as preferences, which we don't necessarily have control over? And do we have control over them? And can we change our preferences? Like we remove an obstacle to choice. Like uh, if I want to get stronger, I can go lift weights. And then I can lift more things. And I can do that. But can I go change my own preferences? Maybe. And so that's kind of the question here. How delicate are they? And how do you go about um, overwhelming your preferences and whether it's an obstacle depends on balance of pros and cons. Well, what does that even mean when it comes to a preference? What is it to be delicate? What's a robustness hypothesis about how delicate something is? I don't know. But, you know, this is why they publish it because this analysis of uh, abilities in terms of uh, preferences and preferring not to and obstacles, you know, this is sort of a fun way of going about it. Okay. Okie dokie. Anybody have any more questions on this one? <coughs> Lewis at literally anything. Pros and cons. Yeah, that's probably the analyticity coming out. Let's go list all the uh, properties and do some analysis. <sighs> yeah. Okay, I'm starting to lose my voice. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I haven't talked this much in a few days. <laughs> I'm out of stream, uh, 
uh, fitness and my, my need to work up my, my shape for being in stream again. I have not done that. And so, uh, I will work up to it. I know all of you guys are here for the Minesweeper. I apologize, not any Minesweeper right now. But thank you for uh, stopping by and uh, have a great night, everybody. You know, maybe we could go see if anyone else is still awake. I suspect, though, if uh, CJ rated me, what, there wasn't anyone else playing the uh, our typical games. So let's see real quick what we got. Anyone online? No. No one is. That's what I thought. Because uh, a bunch of people were streaming earlier tonight, but now they're not streaming. All right, so thank you all for being here. Um, I'll probably try to stream again in the next few days, maybe over the weekend. Let me know. I'll probably have a Minesweeper stream. I know people like the Minesweeper. Um, but thank you all. Everyone treat yourself well. Um, stay safe out there, and uh, be nice to yourself and those around you because... Things have just been a hassle lately. And thanks for the uh, uh, chat, Ugubi and DeMarshall. Oh, yeah, I have to send DeMarshall the video. So. Peace.